During my time in uniform, I think the first time uh, I spoke at one of these breakfasts, I was the deputy director at MDA, and they, uh, it's been an honor to come back every year and hopefully provide some, some new context and some new thinking to the world of missile defense. Uh, General Formica, always uh, an honor, sir, to be with you, and uh, General Formica, as you've heard me state, um, one, of my, one of my mentors in this business. I learned a lot from him, I did in uniform, and I continue to learn from him, so always good to follow you, sir. Um, you know, he talked about offense, defense, and aggression. <laughs> And I think there's no better topic to kind of segue from that discussion than is the topic of hypersonics. In the past, when I've talked here, I've, I've given a lot of thought and um, discussed a lot about the more traditional missile defenses. Uh, with my background in uniform, first at NORAD and NORTHCOM, where I cut my teeth on GMD, and then at Giando, where I, I did a lot of work on the integrated air missile defense, and then finally uh, in my military career at the Missile Defense Agency, uh, where we really were focused on the more traditional threats. And in the last couple of years, as all of you in this room probably know, the focus has remained on that, but it's also started to shift to a new and challenging threat to our nation, and that is the threat of hypersonics. And Joe Formica is absolutely right. When he talks offense, defense, there's, there's really, you can't consider hypersonics without considering them both the offensive and the defensive construct. So today I do want to talk a little bit about hypersonics and um, and I'll be glad to take your questions afterwards as well. So I suspect in this room there's a wide range of knowledge about these new kinds of threats. And you've heard a lot about it, seen a lot about it, read a lot about it. But let me start with some basics, um, just kind of level the playing field here. And, and I'm no, first of all, I'm no expert in hypersonics, but I'm becoming increasingly more aware of the domain and the challenges that it presents and what we as a nation can do about it. So these new types of platforms can deliver devastating payloads. They're becoming more and more like hypervelocity aircraft than traditional missiles. They present a real and present danger to our nation and to the men and women who defend her. The problem, if you can kind of succinctly put it into buckets, I would say a number of things. Number one, very, very fast. They're very speedy in terms of multiple Mach. They maneuver in a, a very unpredictable way, or at least they can. So unlike a ballistic trajectory threat, which is a very sort of predictable pattern, once your sensors sort of lock onto it, multiple phenomenologies, you can predict the path, you can predict an impact point, you can predict a firing solution. Not so with the hypersonic or maneuvering threat. These HTV, or sometimes called blue, boost glide vehicles, are a class of threat in and amongst themselves. They extend the range of suborbital systems and reentry vehicles by employing aerodynamic lift in the higher upper atmosphere. In most examples, Boost Glide roughly doubles the range of a purely ballistic trajectory. In other examples, a series of skip maneuvers allows range to be extended even further and leads to the alternate term skip glide and skip reentry. The problem is that these systems evade our radar coverage and exploit our gaps. The other problem is we don't have really a firing solution to deal with them. Now the concept of hypersonics was first studied as a way to extend the range of ballistic missiles, although it hasn't really been employed in that context. But the underlying aerodynamic concepts have been used to produce maneuverable reentry vehicles to increase accuracy of some other missiles. More problematic for us is the traditional form with an extended gliding phase has been considered as a way to reach targets while flying below our radar cover. So all the sensors that we put out there, terrestrial based, maritime based, in some small cases space based, hypersonics have the ability to fly beneath all of that. That's a problem. Now hypersonics is not a new thing necessarily. The concept has also been used to extend reentry time for vehicles returning to the earth from, of all places, the moon. So back in the Apollo program, uh, some of the techniques and some of the science that was used to get our astronauts back safely really had hypersonic velocities and hypersonic skip maneuvers at its core. Uh, at its core, otherwise to have shed a large amount of velocity in a short time and thereby uh, suffer very uh, sort of bleeding off the high uh, heating loads. And again, the Apollo command module was an example of this. Here's the other problem with hypersonics that we need to consider. So it's maneuverable, hard to detect, uh, it's very, very unpredictable, but they can be used in multiple domains of warfare. So they can be a tactical weapon used against, as an example, potentially a carrier battle group. They can be an operational impact weapon 
used in a theater of operations, or they have the potential to be used in a strategic way, nuclear tip perhaps. And you can imagine now, if you consider all the scenarios in which they may be used, it's a particularly vexing problem for us. Furthermore, they can look very much, at least at the outset, like the ballistic missile launch. So it could be launched from a platform in a peer country that you can imagine, or a near peer country that you can imagine, and our systems start to detect them like they would a ballistic missile. And then suddenly, we lose track on a reentry vehicle, and it turns out to be a hypersonic threat. It's a very simplified way to say it, but again, I hope painting the picture that the problem is our systems today and our entire ballistic missile defense system today is really not arrayed for this. So that is a problem. Our current array of sensors, effectors, command and control networks are not, I say again, are not designed or capable to deal with this threat. Those systems weren't designed at the outset for it. They weren't developed. They're not tested. Although we're starting to test our systems for a hypersonic threat, but in a very sort of basic way. And I know the Missile Defense Agency has got plans to continue to test our existing systems against the hypersonic threat. But I think all would agree that our systems today are insufficient to deal with it. Knocking out an incoming hypervelocity missile threat is even harder, and no one company or no one department or no one agency has all of the answers. This is a national challenge, and it's going to take some creative thinking and some high science to solve it. So what do we do about it? I was always taught never talk about a problem with at least suggesting a solution. I don't mean to have all the answers. But here are a couple thoughts. Number one, first and foremost, it's got to start with space. And a lot has been said about this in the department and leaders across the department. If you were at the Space and Missile Symposium in Huntsville uh, a month ago or so, you heard General Hyten talk about it. You heard General Greaves talk about it. You heard... Uh, time and time again, Admiral Hill talks about this, the deputy at MDA today. It starts with sensing. General Hyten and Admiral Hill are fond of saying, if you can't see it, you can't hit it. Probably heard that. It's a great line, and it's very, very true. So we need to start with the space layer. It needs to be able to acquire, track, and I will take it a step further. I believe it needs to be able to execute a fire control solution on an eventual effect. So it just can't see it got to go beyond that. And we, I think, have the technology to be able to do that in an affordable way, by the way. So it has to start with space. But as those of you who are veterans of this mission know, we had a program that started in space a few years ago, PTSS, the Precision Tracking Satellite System. I think I have that acronym right. Um, it didn't succeed for a number of reasons. I think technology was not um, perhaps mature enough at that point. It was highly expensive. And uh, the nation decided to go a different direction. I think we have the technology today to do it in an affordable way. And the other point is, it can't be a standalone missile defense system. So whatever system we put up there has to be dual role, multi-purpose, and serve multiple missions. I think we can do that. So space, number one. Number two, I do think we'll need a new effector. Now there's some that are talking about taking existing effectors and modifying them to deal with a hypersonic threat. That may be successful in certain cases. Uh, one of those tactical cases, perhaps an operational theater case. But the fact that these hypersonic vehicles are so maneuverable, so unpredictable, I do think, back to General Formica's point about offense-defense, we shouldn't consider our offensive hypersonic capabilities without, without at least thinking about applying them to a defensive way. Offense-defense mix. It's a very, very strong use case for offensive defense together. Excuse me. Third, we must take into account a layered approach. A layered approach. And by that, I mean, again, tactical, operational, strategic. We need to think about it defensively in the same way. We could have some capabilities that are point defense to deal with a hypersonic vehicle sort of at its, its final stages. We could have some that deal with it in the boost phase. We could have some defenses that deal with it in multiple ways. But it needs to be layered, because I think one approach in and of itself is not going to be sufficient. There's going to be leakers, there's going to be problems, you're not going to be able to affect the solution every single time. We need to have a layered approach. And also by layered, I mean not just a kinetic approach. There's a lot of discussion about boost phase intercept, about directed energy, about electronic warfare means to counter a hypersonic threat. You have to take a multiple, uh, multiple, uh, take multiple ways to deal with the problem. So a layered approach, number three. And number four, I would say we need to do this rapidly. 
Hypersonic defense cannot be a program that we envision in 2030 and 2035, this huge behemoth kind of program. It needs to be done with existing technologies at high TRL levels, technology readiness levels in industry, proven technologies that you're able to take and apply in sort of a netted solutions kind of a way to come up with solutions for this problem. The threat is real and it's here today and, it, and our adversaries continue to develop it in a really real way. So this can't be a program that exists in 2030, 2035. We've got to be able to take existing technologies and apply them to the counter hypersonics equation. And I think because of that, we can do this in an affordable way. This is not going to be, uh, again, it can't be a long lead term program. And understanding resources, what they are, I think we need to do this in an affordable way. And I think there are ways to do that. And I know we're very much looking at those ways today. And the Missile Defense Agency has asked us to look at ways that we could get at this problem. So, starts with space, sensing, needs to be done in a multi-purpose way. We do need a new effector. We must take into account hypersonic defenses in a layered approach. And we need to do it rapidly with high technology levels that exist on the shelf today. A couple other points, and then I'll conclude. We need, as we consider these solutions, three things. Number one, there's a revolution going out there within industry and in the industrial complex, and it's happening more, I would say, in the commercial space than the military space, and that is digital transformation. We've got to come up with technologies that are changeable and adaptable and multifunction, and you can extend to the future. So things that are software-defined but hardware-enabled allow you to make software changes to systems that really change their function over time as this threat develops and grows. We can't get a system in place and have it be a static system. You've got to get creative and flexible and adaptable ways to extend it to the future in a rapid way. Digital transformation is a way to do that. Second, we have to take into account from the start command and control. In the past, we've sort of procured systems, put them in place, and then after the thought said, huh, how do we link that to a command and control system? You've got to consider a command and control architecture from the very get-go that will allow us to do counter hypersonics in an affordable way and in a rapid way. Can't not be an afterthought. Too often it's been an afterthought. And number three, and I'm not an engineer, but if you're an engineer, I hope you will, this will resonate with you. We must design a counter hypersonics architecture in a systems engineering, a systems approach kind of a way. And as a member of industry, you know, I'm, I'm one of the people that I think often industry is uh, designs their systems, again, in a very stovepipe way, but without consideration to how it links to other systems. We can't do that in this case. Again, time and affordability are at the forefront of this. What we've got to do, we've got to make some changes to the way we acquire systems of the nation. A systems engineering approach, considering the whole system before we procure any one of its parts. So the, the last thing I'll say about, I think, the vision for hypersonics and how we solve this is it's got to be an end-to-end -end approach. We have to consider the entire kill chain or the entire chain of custody of events that happens left of launch to uh, launch activity or event or an assessment, followed by an intercept, followed by post-intercept assessment. We can't consider this again in the stovepipe or through a soda straw. You just can't consider the effector or a kinetic kill. You've got to do it in an end-to-end -end approach across the entire chain of custody of a launch event and its ultimate demise, hopefully, from our perspective. So I believe we are on the, and this may sound dramatic or hyperbole, but I think we're really on the cusp of a revolution in missile defense that has to take into account hypersonics into our nation's future. We've been spending a lot of time, effort, energy, and resources on more capacity, and that's great. We need more capacity. Our nation needs to grow its missile defenses. I'm, I'm a proponent of that. But we just can't limit it to that. It just can't be about buying more stuff because more of the same is not excuse me, more is not necessarily more when it's more of the same. And I would argue that we've been a little bit focused on more of the same to the detriment of our future and to the future threats. I'll close by a nod to Joe Formica, the way he always closes, rightly so, a nod to our airmen, sailors, soldiers, Marines, Coast Guard men and women that are out there and civilians. I will extend it one step further as a member of industry now. Um, I will extend it to the, to, the, to the men and women in industry as well who are have their core patriots who are concerned about the security of our nation and are doing some really, really great, terrific work to solve this problem. So it's an honor to be a part of that 
fraternity now that I've left my last one, or at least active duty service, and part of the industry team. Thank you for uh, paying attention, and uh, Joe, yeah. Mike, and I uh, look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you.